My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, some of you may know that I recently have taken up voice lessons with Mervyn. I thought it would be nice, <laughs> Wendy says good, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> Maybe my singing has been really bad. Anyways, <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> I thought it would be nice to have a bit of a change up. So much of my life is consumed with doing things that are always for a purpose or for some task. And I felt like I wasn't really having an opportunity to simply do something creative, to challenge myself in a new way. However, little did I realize that if I were to do voice lens, lessons, I'd have to sing. <laughs> and I'd have to sing in front of other people. And I was terrified. My first lesson, I went downstairs and I actually rejoiced greatly because nobody was in the church and I thought, Oh, thank God, nobody else will have to hear the howls and the noises coming from the basement. I wonder what sort of medieval practice we got going on down there. But Mervyn, in his ever so gentle and kind way, helped me to relax. And what I found striking about it is the way to relax was to fully embrace and fully inhabit my body, fully inhabit the moment, and let go, and just enter fully into this moment of singing. It was a striking lesson for me that if I really wanted to sing, I had to give myself fully and completely to the moment, to let go of every fear, every anxiety, and just simply live into that moment. And the more that I did, the happier I felt, and the more beautiful my singing was. Or so I think. <laughs> Mervyn could be the judge on that later. <laughs> I thought a lot about this in recent weeks, actually, that in order to make great music, one has to give oneself totally and completely to it without fear, without holding back, and without any concern for how others may judge or think of you. And I saw a parallel to our Christian life as well. And it's a parallel that I think Jesus brings up today in the gospel. So today's gospel is a little bit confusing. And in order to make this connection, I want to step back a little bit here. This gospel is utterly perplexing. Jesus, the one who we believe has come into the world to bring peace and love, is now telling us in Luke's gospel that he's come to divide father against son, mother against daughter. It's a really bizarre language. What exactly is Jesus getting at? To better understand what's happening here is Luke is writing to a Gentile audience, Christians who were not actually uh, Jewish. We are believed that they were either living in Antioch at the time or, or southern Turkey. But it was a community that was deeply concerned about how would the Romans perceive them. And there was a real anxiety in the community that if the Christian community lived fully into its vocation, if Christians became too vocal about their faith, that the Romans would essentially judge them. Or that their living into their faith would perhaps jeopardize the community. And so there were some Christians at that time that were saying, Okay, this is great that we have Jesus. This is great that we want to follow this way, but do so quietly. We don't want anybody to know. Because if we do, it puts us in real danger. We're at risk of getting into trouble with the Romans. And they weren't off. The reality was, in the first few centuries of Christianity, it was a very dangerous thing to be a Christian. It wasn't some nicety that we said, oh, I'm a Christian and I follow Jesus, as we sometimes hear today. To become a disciple of Jesus Christ at that time 
meant that you likely would be disregarded by society and the religious world of the time. It likely meant that you could possibly face persecution, even death itself. So this fear is understandable. It's understandable why some Christians at that time really were concerned about possibly being too vocal or too obvious about their faith life. But Luke comes in and says, no. Jesus entered into this world to upend the just injustice, to transform the broken and the pain that is felt in this world. And you and I as Christians are the ones to do that. The only way that we can bring about this kingdom of God is to actually go out into the world and be clear about who we are and to live fully into our vocation to be another Christ, to proclaim justice, freedom, and peace for all God's people. And guess what? That is going to divide people. Not everyone is going to want to hear this message. And even for our own communities, we're going to struggle with this. Because it's going to mean that we're going to have to get beyond ourselves to let go and fully embrace this life. And it's going to challenge us. It's going to stretch us in ways that we can hardly imagine or know. But if we do, God's reign of peace and justice shall prevail. And Jesus warns, if we don't, only death and destruction shall be ours. Read the signs of the time. Now, it is a challenging gospel. And while you and I may not necessarily live in the same time as those early Christians, and our world has drastically changed, I think we Christians today have an entirely different challenge. It's all too easy for us to simply say we're Christian, go to church, do the things that Christians do, but then we walk out the door and it has no impact on our life. Do you ever invite anybody to join? Are you willing to go out and share the new life that you've encountered here? That's hard, but that's precisely what we're to do. And it may put you at risk of suddenly finding yourself different, a stranger. But it also may open the opportunity for somebody else to experience the life-giving grace of God at a time when they need it most. Now, as some of you know, I've been here for about a over a year now, interesting. And one of the things that has struck me here in some ways is we have a really amazing thing going on here. And I'm not just talking liturgy. If any of you, liturgy alone, we have a good thing going on here. If, having been in multiple churches, I'll tell you, we are very fortunate to have an extraordinary music program with such wonderful singers and such talented people who minister at the table. But we also have a ministry that reaches out to people well beyond these walls. Thursdays, if you'd see the people coming in, as I've told you before, the number of women and men that come into this church seeking a place of solitude and hope is astounding. People are yearning. They're hungry for this. But what strikes me here And what I find always so fascinating is that I don't think we believe that ourselves. So often this year I've heard people say, when we plan a new liturgy, such as tomorrow night, nobody will come. Who's going to show up? Or we hear people question, why are we trying this new thing? Or even as we're facing today, Why are we getting rid of this building? 
What I find striking in all of it is we seem to doubt ourselves. We don't believe in ourselves. And we don't necessarily want to fully live into this because that may actually cost us something. It's going to challenge us to be living the gospel. It may mean that for our ministry to continue and to find new expression, that we may have to get rid of things that meant a lot to us, such as the hall next door. But the thing is, we're not here for ourselves. We're here for the world. And right now, that hall isn't allowing us to live into the vocation that God has called us to be, to bring life to a world that's wounded and really suffering by violence, poverty, hunger. So maybe now we do have to let go of that to embrace a new ministry. And maybe now we need to be creative and think of new ways in which we proclaim the gospel. Maybe we capitalize on the gifts that we have here and use it as an opportunity to invite people in and see the good things that God has at work in this parish, such as tomorrow night. Showcasing the incredible, extraordinary music we have, inviting other parishes to join with us so that St. Anne's not only becomes a beacon in this community, but a beacon of hope in the West End of Toronto. Do we believe we have something good to offer? Or are we here just to simply satisfy ourselves? Are we afraid to go out there and actually invite others to this, to share the good news? Or are we willing to be bold and to say, God has something here for you? My friends, over this coming year, now that we're coming to a new stage, what we're doing today is a major step, and I'm grateful to those who have ministered these past few months and trying to guide us through this process of selling the hall. But as Mark and I talk, and Mark, unfortunately, you get picked on in my sermons a lot, I feel. (laughs) But Mark and I, and the other wardens, we've talked a lot. What we're about to do is going to allow us to do extraordinary ministry. I did not constantly be held back, struggling, trying to figure out a way to sustain ourselves with resources that no longer enable us to do ministry. Quite literally, this frees us up to do great things. Now all we need is to believe in ourselves. And to be able to go out there and say, you know what, we can do great things. As we say each week at the end of the liturgy, glory to God whose power working within us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Are you willing to believe and to commit to seeing St. Anne's thrive and do well? Then God be praised. If you're not, I invite you to ask yourself, Why? Maybe it's a time for a change. But God is calling us here and now to be a church that is willing to go beyond these walls, to reach out to those who desperately yearn for life. Will you join me in that? Will you invite others to share in the good things God has in store for us? Amen.